Okay, so today we're going to talk about the most important areas of maintenance in the split split lens injection systems. And uh, if you look here, then on all the skull heads, you see there's a lot of areas where something can go wrong. And if I would see this kind of uh, slide, I would think, oh wow, how I'm going to solve all that? Well, all the skull heads represents an area where something may go wrong, which Usually it's pretty obvious. So we start with the position of the column in the liner. You can put a column in there. Uh, if you shift it up too far, you inject below the column inlet. So you get a very small response. Put it at the same level where you're going to inject. You go get non-reproducible, very big peaks. But if you put it too low, you also have a problem because you're going to get some tailing and especially you're going to see tailing on your solvent peak. The solvent normally should be a very nice sharp peak like a, the trunk of a tree. Uh, if you put the column too low below the bottom of your liner, you're going to see tailing. Your liner, your analyte response is the same, but that's not the issue. But it's much better to integrate on a straight baseline than on a skimmed baseline. That has to do with the column position in your liner. So your column always needs to be in the bottom of your liner, not below. Okay, so you have to make sure you are going to use the right ferrules. Now, the smaller bore columns, the 0.15 to 0.25, they have the same OD, yes, yeah, so you can use the standard 0.4 millimeter hole ferrule. The larger diameter need a little bit bigger ferrule. Make sure you do not never use a large diameter ferrule for a smaller bore column because you have to squeeze it much more. And when you do that, the column may be bent towards the side of the liner and you will get wall effects, which you don't want. Now, the other thing is, if you are going to use a new ferrule, a new ferrule has no grip on the tubing. So to make that distance correctly, it's going to be a bigger challenge because that, that ferrule is just well, movable. Well, for that, there are tools available. I know Restic has for every GC brand, they have a different tool. Just simply to pre-set the ferrule, to pre-seat the ferrule or pre-squeeze the ferrule. So it has a little bit of grip on the tubing. So to make sure that the, you can correctly adjust that position in your liner. Now for the Agilent, there are two different types. They have the standard ferrules and they have the compact ferrules. So there are, there are different gauges for that. Now there's another way that you also want to apply. You can also take an old septum and, and shift that septum over the column yes and then put the fitting onto that septum so it it gets withhold here by the septum because it, that's a fixed point and now you can cut a piece of the the front because when you stick a column through an existing ferrule some graphite may be squeezed off so now we, you can adjust this length to be the correct distance and you have to check with your brand of GC, what that distance is. And like she had for, for Agilent is four to seven millimeters. Now there is some confusing information out there. I just want to warn you. I found this on a on YouTube where they gave some information about splitless injection. Now these are the uh, say the pictures they added, and as you see that. In a splitless injection, if you're going to put your column in this position, it's absolutely not okay. Yes, uh, why? In splitless injection, you only have to carry the gas that drives the analytes into the column. Now, below the column inlet, there's no driving force here, so you, you never can get reproducibility. So, the column should be positioned always in the bottom of the line. In this case, for the splitless injection, it should be positioned over here. Yep. So just make sure that you check that out. Okay. Then we have to 
let's say fix the connection, tightening the ferrule. And very often we use these <coughs> these nice tools, the wrenches, and they work. But the ferrules that we use are mostly graphite, yes, or graphitized vesicle graphite, and they can deform very easily. So uh, I always recommend. So if you want to have an easy to maintenance system, consider to use the the finger tight nuts. Yes, finger tight nuts are available. Here are several for Agilent. Uh, I know there's even they call it a hot swap nut. Uh, it has a little bit bigger grip and it has some cooling holes in there and. The marketing literature tells you you do not get any burned fingers. Well, that's not really true because if the system cools down, this thing is still hot. Unless you play guitar like I do, you can do it with your left hand. But anyway, it has a little bit bigger grip, so it really is easy to use. So very, very nice. But other systems have also these fast feeling tools, uh, Thermo, Shimatsu has these, and I think these are also offered by Restack. So you don't need the wrenches. And what I always recommend, use only a set for one diameter of column. So I have a set for 0.25, a set for 0.32, and for 0.53, and only use it for that diameter. You can reuse it many, many times. So it's basically, a, 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 it saves a lot of money because you do not have to use uh, new ferrules for a long time. Just make sure you put it in the right position. Okay, then we have to check for leaks. Seems logic. The challenge is in a, a column, we have only a very small amount of stationary phase. Yes, uh, 0.25 micron films. That's over 30, 60 meter column lengths. And usually when there's oxygen or water in the carrier gas. It, it will attack the stationary phase and it, it will make the column bleed more. And, and typically what you will see, and you can check yourself, if you run a temperature program, you're gonna see that the baseline increases exponentially. And when you heat it up to the final temperature, and if you see that the baseline, is just creeping up, slowly that's an indicator that you may have some leaks in the system still normally you should see this baseline goes up and then it fades off that is a normal uh, behavior and that will also give you information that you do not have any any leaks and the other thing is you're going to see also the absolute baseline of that the leads it definitely will be higher if you have somewhere in the system a, a leak where you have the water or the oxygen introduced, you're going to see an absolute higher background signal than when you do not have a leak. So leak detection is important. And of course, the conventional way is to use the Snoop leak detectors. And yeah, well, that's not a really good way to do this. It works but it, it's there are better ways so there are now leak detectors available um, these detectors are basically there's a little vacuum pump in there and the vacuum pump it will suck the air around the fitting now if there are some helium or hydrogen molecules there inside that leak detector there is a a chip thermal conductivity cell like the TCD detector, it has a Wheatstone bridge. And when there are helium or hydrogen molecules there, there's an imbalance in that bridge, and it will immediately give you a signal, a digital signal. So you see LEDs lit, they light up, or you can hear an audience, like a noise that is telling you uh, there's a leak. Now, it's a very clean way to do this because there's no contamination that is quite opposite of when you use Snoop. But you can also use this detector for checking your septums in uh, the lifetime of your septum. How, how many injections can you do before I have to replace my septum? Now the signal basically reports on helium. It's been very sensitive. You get a red LED signal. The more LEDs 
are lit up, the bigger the leak is. So that's for helium hydrogen. But also if you use argon, uh, the conductivity of argon is lower than that of air. So you get an, an opposite response. You will get a, a yellow uh, signal. And well, uh, since same for, for nitrogen, since the uh, sensitivity for these gas is not as big, so this will already indicate quite a, a big leak. For helium and hydrogen, it, it, the detector is very sensitive. So where do you need to check? Well, seems logic, you have a cylinder and a reducer there. You have filtration devices with connections. You have a shot off. What else that you need to check out? And of course, at the GC, you have a connection with your EPC. Then at the split line, there are split line filters. You need to check out. Be careful here because there is an helium or hydrogen flow coming out of that split line. So that may give you a false positive. So make sure that when you measure this, that you hold the leak detector a little bit away because it uses normal air as its reference gas. Okay, then on our inlet, we have the septum nut and the septum itself. And then below, there are the weldments for your carrier gas line. And sometimes there are micro cracks in here that you just want to secure that, that they're not there. Then inside the oven, you have a reducing union there with a the connection. And you can use a connector with your column, which can be a normal connector of a finger tight, like you see over here. And if you use a guard column, a pre-column retention gap, you may have also a coupling in the oven that you need to check out. Okay, then we're going to run samples, and then we have to look at what can happen there. Well, first of all, if we inject through a septum, the needle that we use can be very sharp. And little pieces of septum can be ripped off. Now we see them here on top of the needle guide. The yeah, needle guide is just something that it guides the needle into the center of the liner. But you see little red dots here, and these red dots can also make it in your liner. Yes, and when they make it in your liner, like we see over here, uh, this liner is hot. Yeah, because the liner is hot. It's going to, to make these septum particles bleed. The septum particles are made of polydimethyl siloxane. It's the same polymer you also use as stationary phase. So you're producing here degradation products and you're injecting them all the time in your column. Now you may think, ah, oh, wow, that's just a little piece that shouldn't be so important. Well, realize that this little piece of septum particle may be the same amount of PDMS as I have in the entire column. Yes, we have only a 0.25 micrometer film there. But there's another effect. Yeah. What do you think that happens if you inject your analytes in a liner that has a few of these particles? Your analytes are going to see this particle, yes? And they see this as stationary phase. So they are going to dissolve and they come out again. Huh? That takes time. So that's perfect for discrimination. So your line on developed retention. So you need really need to be aware of this process and make sure you minimize this uh, because it can really impact your RSDs big time. Now here we see a very extreme case. Yes, as we see now, we, we see also here the, the, the cool thing about the precision liners or, or when you use wool at the top is that the septum stuff, it stays on top. Yes, and with a little bit of luck, you're going to inject through this garbage into the wool and the impact of the say septa is not that big but uh, this is not a good uh, say situation so how can you deal with that well consider to use more friendly needles yes there are more friendly needles that you can choose from 
instead of the very short conventional needle. And you can also choose SEPTA that already have a, they call it a center guide. We have them in all different formats. And the, the center guide, has, it, it will guide the needle through the septum. And especially if you're going to use this with the needles, as we see over here, it will help us. Now, be aware, this is a better type of septum, but since there is already a, a kind of center guide, it will start to leak earlier. So you, you may see a shorter average septum lifetime, but I definitely would recommend to use this because the benefits really uh, are, are much bigger than the, uh, the challenges. Now, another thing that can happen in this inlet is when you are going to use a very fast auto sampler, and, and you know, it's always the different vendors, they try to compete, they tell each other, my auto sampler is fast. Well, mine is faster. Well, fast doesn't always mean good. And I give you an example here. We see the needle guide over here. And with this application, with the, the 7683 auto sampler, that excellent one, we, we saw all kinds of scratches appearing on the needle guide. Now, we're curious, what are we looking at? So we looked in the liner and we found a lot of residues in the liner you see all these little pieces they were just punched off the needle guide now if you run only hydrocarbons aromatics yes or some uh, neutral solvent you probably will not pick up any impact of this um, so we took a challenging test and it's like the the way how the rest of the company tested liners is they they put a very small amount of DDT, like 50 picograms, and uh, same as, as Enrin. They put it in a liner, and then they are going to do a splitless injection. They look what happens. Now the Enrin and DDT, they can react with any active site. And you see here, when they compare the, the normal injection system with the thermalite septum, and we compare it with a micro seal, you see that the degradation of the endrin goes linear up with the number of injections the ddt didn't do that now if endrin does this you need to be aware that in your type of analytics this may also give a kind of a reaction or, and give you an artifact so be aware so plan b is to uh, eliminate that septum and there is a choice there you can choose for a uh, Merlin micro seal that's a seal that's been available for many many years and you can use them or buy them for older GC brands it's very stable has pretty long lifetime and if you even use it with a septum purge yes when you use it with a septum purge you may even use this seal even when it starts leaking a little bit yeah so you get even more analysis out of it the the, the septum flush it will take away the, any air that goes through this septum. So it will allow you to use this seal a little bit longer because it's expensive. Yeah, that's, that's definitely a thing. It's more expensive than a septum. When you use this, make sure you have a tapered needle like we shown over here. With a tapered needle, you, you will uh, enter the seal in the center and it will give you the longest uh, lifetime. Okay, number six, we get contamination. And well, the contamination can happen in the liner, but it can also build up in your split line. I always ask customers if you use a split injection, where does the sample go? Yeah, one part goes in the column. Where does the rest go? Yeah, in the split line. Well, your split line is not heated. And that means if you run a sample with a significant matrix, it's going to deposit in your split line. And that can even result in a blockage. You can have a change of split ratio. You're going to see ghost peaks. And also, you can have a bias. So this is something that you need to be aware of 
Of course, it depends on how pure your samples are, but here's an example. I was in the UK several years ago at a food lab, and we gave a seminar, and a week later, the lab manager sent me this chromatogram, and he asked me, well, what are these bulbs here, these broad peaks? Now, if you have a broad peak in your chromatogram, if it's a broad peak, it means something is introduced in a very bad way. So I told him, well, uh, when was the last time you checked your split line? And, well, he didn't do that. And now he did. And he, well, he cleaned out the whole line. And we see now the blue chromatogram is how it's supposed to be. And you see, it looks very nice. So that's a, a typical learning curve. That split line is quite important. You need to clean, make sure that there is no deposit in there. Now you can replace that line yourself. And this is one of the latest uh, Agilence. With, uh, there's a gray cover, you can take it off and then you can disconnect this split line. And in this case, it's a copper tube. You could rinse it with some solvents, or you can just put a new piece of copper tube in place to be sure that you have a clean split. Now you, now you may think, how is it possible that the stuff that is in that split line gets back in your injection system? Uh, now, theoretically, when you have always a positive flow, you it, it should not come back. Yeah, that's true, but you are going to do maintenance, yes? And, and maintenance, you're going to turn off the flow. Yes, and during that time, all that material that is built up in that split line has a chance to get back in your injection system, especially if you do not cool down the injection system. Yes, now, we always recommend to do that, but not everyone is doing that, actually. So this is a, another cause of contamination. Now, at the end of the split line, there is a filter. Yes, that filter is supposed to take out the analytes. Uh, it's filled with a, uh, let's say, a carbon. There's an active carbon to put high retention. But in time, these traps, they're going to, uh, well, they're going to, let's say, saturate. And they can even start to restrict the flow. So be aware that these filters have to be replaced regularly. Now you can do this easily yourself. Yes, uh, but you can also go to YouTube and take a look at one of the videos that's been posted. If you want to have larger capacity ones, there, there are uh, they are available. Uh, Restic supplies them. Okay, so that was a split line. Okay, now the other area that often causes an issue is the carrier gas line. Yes, we have the split line. We have to also the carrier gas from the uh, cylinder to the inlet. Now here I'm going to give you an example of a, uh, a challenge. This was a chromatogram. Customer sent us um, claiming that the column was bleeding. Now, uh, if you know chromatograms uh, like we do, you see that the bleed starts already very early, and this is not a normal bleed pattern. Something is eluding there. A normal bleed pattern looks like this. You have an exponential increase of your baseline. That's normal. Now, lucky enough, this was an application where the user had a mass spec. So we asked, can you give us a TIC? What is eluding here? Now, if you know a little bit about mass spec, the fragmentation pattern here and you can see the difference between the main fragments is, is 14. Yes, it's 14. And, and that typically means that's CH2. So that's typical hydrocarbon fragmentation. And the 207, which is siloxane, was very low. So we know this is not column with something else is coming out. And indeed, customer was running hydrocarbon oils and he had the problem of injector contamination. So now we have to clean the inlet. So how do you do that? 
well, you can call a service guy, but you can easily do it yourself. Take out the column, the column is okay. Install a two meter of an old column, set it at high flow, high split. Yes, do not connect it with the detector because uh, you better plug off your detector during the time that you're going to do this maintenance. Just heat up injector and let it flush for a couple of hours. Then replace the parts and run a blank. And look at the blank. The blank should look like this. If you still see some garbage there on the baseline, then you probably have to repeat that procedure a few times more to make sure you get rid. Normally, when you heat up an inlet, also the, the carry gas line, it will also heat up quite a bit. So the backsplash that was happening here, yes, the matrix that was deposited in your carry gas line, you can then also flush out. Now, if you have a mass spec, it's usually easier to do the troubleshooting because you can link the fragmentation with a component and link with a source, yes. Uh, with an FID is a little bit more difficult, but the basic problem is that there was a back flash, meaning the sample volume was bigger than the liner volume. Yeah. And what happens then, the sample goes out on top and it flashes back in your carrier gas. And same as the split line, your carrier gas line is not heated. So the matrix phases out and you will have to live with the results. That means you get less reproducibility. You see also big tailing of your solvent peak. Yes, because this will give you very bad solvent peak. And the same when we put the column into low uh, in the injection port, and you will see memory effects. Now, these memory effects usually typically are, are, are called uh, carryover, yes, or memory effects or system peaks. And no, you screwed up. You injected too much. Yes, you contaminated your system. And you have to clean it out. So you have to make sure that doesn't happen. So you need to know how much can I inject? Now, as you see, the injection volume, the expanded gas volume, this is a 250C, 73 kPa. You can see that the volume is related to the molecular weight of the solvent. Now, if I take this data, I put it in a different format. You can see now also why I always would recommend users to go for larger diameter liners, like four millimeter. Yes, with this liner, you can inject the biggest amount. Yes, the largest volume. And even here, for methanol, don't exceed 0.8 microliters. And for water, even much lower. If you are going for a smaller liner diameter, you're going to ask for trouble because the injection volumes, uh, yes, they decrease exponentially. Yes, and you can get easily in a problem uh, situation like we are discussing. So to minimize backflash, large volume liners, small injection volumes, try to use higher carrier gas flows. And if you really need to inject a lot, you may consider to add a restriction to your column. So add a two meter 0.1. So you now instead of 100 kPa, you can run at 300 kPa. And that will reduce the volume of your, your, your sample. You can also use a pressure program. So you start in your injection at a higher pressure. It compresses the sample. And then when the injection is completed, yes, yeah, after 10, 20 seconds, you're going back to the normal pressure. Most easy, of course, is to use a higher molecular weight solvent. Okay, eight, split injection. Make sure that we use wool. Yes, this is an important one. In a split injection, everything happens in a very short time. In a fraction of a second, so you need fast injection, fast evap, fast mixing, and fast transfer. Anything that is going to impact this process is going to give us higher RSDs. So that's why you need for split injection, you always, your number one choice is always a liner with wool on the top. You're going to inject 
in the wool. The wool, it will give you the heat capacity to get the evaporation going. Because I, I always say, what happens if you put a microliter of acetone or hexane on your finger and then blow your finger? What do you feel? Yes, your finger gets cold. Now, the same happens in your liner. If you inject a sample, the temperature goes down. If you have no wool there, you're going to have a temperature gradient in the gas phase of your liner, and you get all the effects of that, meaning very high RSDs. If you're going to run a wool-filled liner, the wool will take care of the temperature drop. So you will get very good RSDs. So this is always the number one liner you need to consider. Here's another way how you can also simulate this. If you have a fast auto sampling injection, you can imagine droplets reach your column. Ask him for trouble. The wool will guarantee a nice smooth evaporation and give you the right RSDs. The other advantage of this design of liner is what we saw before already, that the wool it will capture the septa particles. Yeah, so now you inject below these septa particles, so you will not have direct impact of your analytes uh, interacting with these septum particles. Make sure when you look at these liners that uh, when you use them, the wool needs to be packed homogeneously, like we see on the right picture. Right? The, the left one, this is not okay. Yeah, so inspect your liner accordingly. Now, the other challenge that we sometimes see is that a customer tells us, hey, that liner, that wool is moving. So uh, how about that? Yeah, well, that's definitely, if you run a liner like this, it's a straight liner with wool, it will work perfectly if it stays that way. If the wool goes up, you're going to inject through the wool and you have the problem again of non-reproducibility. Now I get it, this is the cheapest liner you can get. I understand that, but you will have to face with this problem because when your flow changes or when you set your carrier gas velocities or a change of pressure or a change of flow, that plug may move. Yes, so that's why they developed these liners where you put the wool between some tapers and so it will stay there and it it will give you the reproducibility that you can get. Now, of course, we get questions also, can we also clean liners? Uh, yeah, of course, it's not recommended, but uh, you, you can clean liners, yes? You can put them in some uh, very uh, strong acid, yes? And, 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 and really uh, ultra tune them, uh, uh, but you also need to deactivate them. And that, that's a different process. Yes, liner deactivation is not that easy. Uh, now, there are tools available that you can uh, put the wool in yourself, yeah, liner packing and, and coolers and insurers. And maybe you have applications that you run neutral analytes where deactivation is not that important. But if you run trace analysis of, of say, more difficult analytes. Have to think about drugs of abuse, explosives, carbamates, pesticides. Then the liner inertia is quite uh, trivial. So now when you fill wool yourself in a liner, uh, wool can always break. And when wool breaks, the little pieces can also get into your column and cause also an active site. So, so be careful there. Now also syringes, if you use syringes, uh, make sure that when you do an injection that there are no air bubbles in your syringe because that will also lead to uh, non-reproducible data. Okay, liner replacement. Okay, we already talked a little bit about that. Often Restec is asked, why do you offer so many liner configurations? Yeah, and then I answer, it's because you keep on ordering them. Yeah, so I, we can give you recommendations for five, six liners that will all fit your needs. Yes, but the problem is once you use a certain liner, 
that gives you good data, you're not going to replace it. That's why there are so many liners. So the choice of line depends on the technique that you use and the type of sample that we are going to analyze. So basically for split injection, yes, if you have a solvent matrix, 98% of applications can use this simple liner. The four millimeter, they call Restec precision with wool on top. Yes, you get good data, good evaporation. Only you move to a liner without wool if there is something going wrong with this liner. For instance, if your matrix or sample interacts with the wool. So here you could go to, for instance, the best results you can use with a cyclo liner. You, you never get the same results as with the precision liner. Yes, it, you will get higher RSDs, but if you combine this liner also with a different injection technique, like a hot needle technique, it will give you quite, let's say, reproducible data. Now for split less injection, the default liner will be a single taper with wool on the bottom. So this one will also work in majority of applications, only in split less, you often deal with very low levels and sometimes with very, let's say, polar compounds. And the wool sometimes gives you a headache there because your analytes are going to interact with the wool. So in split lists, very often we choose also a liner without wool. And the best results that we found you get with this cyclo liner and even with the double taper. Now, this is an expensive liner, yes? And so I'm, I, I understand that that may be a, a thing. So plan B on this side is you can also consider to use the double taper, that's this one, the double taper, or the single taper. We never have found any difference between these two, but you will find in a lot of applications that they, they have used this one, uh, but this one, will do as well. Uh, that's a much, let's say, more economical solution. And, and, and I also must say, uh, listen, if you're going to do a trace analysis and you're going to report 10, 20, 50 PPBs, uh, you, you do not need the accuracy of, let's say, 1% uh, or so. You, you're happy that you can go plus or minus 10% at those levels. So. In that part, these liners also work pretty fine. Now, the liners will contaminate. And here you see already after 28 injections, the dirt builds up, yes? And you can see that if you run a calibration, you typically will see that the higher boilers, they will fade off. So that's a signal for you that you have to do something. Replace a liner, or maybe you can get a few more runs out of this liner if you heat it up to a higher temperature, uh, but that's something you don't really want to do. So you're going to replace the liner. So how can you get more analysis out of your liner? Well, first, trying to inject a smaller volume. If you can get your detection limits, yes, and your calibration with a smaller sample size, your liner will last longer. Also, if you want to invest in more sample cleanup, that will work, but that takes some time. A simple thing that you may want to try is just set your inlet at a lower temperature. Decrease your inlet temperature, but by 10 or 20 degrees. Yes, if you can run your calibration, you still have the similar results. I can assure you at a lower liner temperature, it will last also longer so you get more runs out of that liner of course the best way is to use back flash systems yes if you can use a back flash system to clean out your liner after each injection that will be perfect but that's only available in a limited uh, configurations okay last one is the number 10 the septum replacement what's the septum well septum is made of polydimethyl siloxane one septum contains about 60 times more PDMS than they have the entire column. You are using that septum to seal the inlet, so it's going to be hot. 
Yes, and it's gonna produce degradation products. Now there is a purge, septum purge, septum flush, that will get rid of that septum degradation product. So something that you definitely need to use. But if you inject through the septum, particles will accumulate, and we already saw what they can do. So when do you need to replace your septum? Once a day, every week, every month. The lifetime depends on a number of things. Yeah, the type of septum, the temperature, the type of syringe, needle top I use, how well is my water sampler centrating, and, and the solvent. And I like to replace it before a leak develops. Now, consider to use that leak detector, because that leak detector will give you that information. And you can have one system, you probably have to replace the septum every 30 runs. And the neighbor, it only has to replace every 200 runs. It all depends on that particular configuration. And maybe you've seen this yourself. If you take out the septum, out of your septum cap, the side of the septum that is in contact with the carrier gas, that's the bottom side, it sometimes looks a little bit oily. It looks like it's wet. Well, that's basically, these are the septum bleed products that are, let's say, diffusing out of your septum. Now, I can tell you, if you can see it, it we're not talking about a nanogram here. Yeah? So that's happening on the inside of your inlet. So better be aware that we use that septum purge. So to minimize that problem, make sure you use lowest temperature of your septum and injection port. Always use your septum purge. Consider new generation septa. I, I like the ones with the center guide. Yeah, that's definitely it. If you use them together with the uh, with the more friendly needles, you, you will get less uh, septum trouble. Replace septa on time. Yes, that's something you can measure. You can also get rid of septa and try to use a, a valve injection. You can set up a valve and inject into a split system or go for the Merlin seal type uh, approach. And that will also eliminate the septum issue. Now, practically, if you want to do troubleshooting, it's, you always want to, to, to do something about the, the problem. So it's always good to have spares available. And think about the O-rings, the ferrules, the, the liners, septa, the even columns you can have as, as a spare. Uh, of course, the, the vendors will send you these parts as soon as they can, but it, it will take at least a day. And usually you don't want to wait a day, so make sure that you have spares available. Okay, so these were the, the 10 most important areas that you need to uh, be aware of in a Typical split split as injection system. I, I hope you picked up a few bits and pieces. If you have any questions, uh, please uh, write the, the chat box and, and I, I will try to answer. Uh, again, thank you for your attention.